Let's have some fun. I want to. Uh... <laughs> are those bats? What are these? Are... <laughs> yeah, you know, in those old churches, you know, where the ladies oh, okay. could do this. This is uh, this is for you. No, 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 no. This no, is for you. Oh, okay. This is for you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> For the next couple of minutes. He's already forgotten which one is which. See that? <laughs> Gender confusion. Uh, See what, I told you. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I want you to channel each other for a minute. That's the purpose of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me start with John. Oh, me. Okay. Uh, John, you believe deeply in the importance of marriage equality. You've spent years of your life writing, thinking, advocating, just pouring your soul out to struggle for the attainment of marriage equality in America. I want you to dig deeply within you, and I want you to give me in 60 to 90 seconds the essence of your case for marriage equality. Uh People fall in love. Uh, to sustain that love over a lifetime requires commitment, and it requires a community that is willing to recognize and help sustain that commitment. And so one of the things I really do agree with Maggie Gallagher about is that marriage... <laughs> mar marriage is not just about rights and benefits. Um, it is a social institution, which the law recognizes because it's good to love and people need help to sustain that love across the vicissitudes of life. And so for me, the most important reason for supporting marriage equality, although I do accept the rights-based arguments and a lot of the others, but for me, the heart of it is uh, that it's good to find someone to love for gay people. This is going to be someone of the, uh, of the same sex. And I believe that we can have marriage uh, between same-sex couples without taking anything away from anything else. And so the justice arguments are true, but many of the people who advocate them, I think, um, sometimes have a thin vision of marriage. Uh, and I think that, well, I think I just said what I think John's you know, Your. argument is. Yes. My argument. Thank you. I'm, I'm not very good at crossing gender like that. <laughs> you did a good job. Maggie, you are probably the most important leader in the country in the effort to stop gay marriage. You have poured years of your life into this effort. You've thought long and hard about it for many years. You've thought long and hard about the issue of marriage for many years. I want you to dig deep. I want you to give it to me from the heart and soul. 90 seconds, 60 to 90 seconds, the essence of your argument about why gay marriage is a bad idea. Well, I want to make it clear that my argument against gay marriage is ultimately not about gay marriage. It's about marriage and, and why we as a society have marriage and do marriage and why marriage evolved the way that it did, uh, which involves some fundamental truths about the way sex makes babies and society needs babies. And those babies, those children, do well, do best when cared for by their own mother and father. So for me, the case against same-sex marriage is really, I mean, the case for marriage as it has been traditionally understood because of the values that that achieves, linking mothers and fathers in commitment to each other and to their children. And the problem with same-sex marriage is it turns us away from that important message about children needing mothers and fathers and instead makes marriage about the needs of adults for love and companionship. And I don't deny that people need love and companionship and that, or that love and companionship are important things, but that then marriage is no longer about this very special task of binding children to mothers and fathers. And when we turn away from that, we find that not only 
is marriage less able to perform that crucial task, but that those who try to stay focused on that task and defend a traditional view of marriage start getting marginalized uh, and sometimes even um, ostracized as bigots. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you both for indulging me in that, that exercise, and I thank you both for the... Well, let me just say, um, starting with you, John, what did you make of Maggie's answer? I was impressed by it. Um, you, you read the book. No, and I think that, I mean, the, 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 I would simply, it's not even a matter of correction, but of elaboration, that when we're talking about the importance of love in people's lives, it's not just sort of love as this warm and fuzzy feeling of I'm with somebody and that makes me feel good. It's that ongoing commitment, uh, that ongoing task of being there for someone and vice versa and of building a life together. And there's something unique and special about that. How do you do, Maggie? Um, I think it was a fair intellectual summary. Uh, I don't think that John still gets, and this is probably my fault, he only sort of, I think, it, why I care enough about this, uh, or how someone who he probably, I don't want to speak for him, but thinks is a reasonably um, well-intentioned and uh, intelligent person believes what I believe, and so I, I think that would not, I would not say that if I were speaking from my heart. It's a fair intellectual summary of some of the cognitive Words content. but not the music maybe kind of thing? Or? Yeah, I don't think that's his fault either. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think, I think he did a good job. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering how this book, the experience of writing the book, um, affected you. How did it, well, let's just begin with this. Um, how it, well, did it change the way you think about any of these issues? Did the experience of writing the book change the way either of you, you know, as opposed to, say, another opportunity to, to explicate your views, did it change anything for you intellectually? I think what it did is it brought to greater light some of what um, Maggie's concerns are. And, and I, I, I'll grant that I'm probably not very good at getting at the sort of emotional heart of those concerns. Uh, maybe that's partly my fault as a philosophy no. professor. I tend to put it in terms of arguments. I want it step by step. But, uh, you know, the, the marriage debate so often is about sort of, you know, laying out and explicating our own views and, and, and very, very rarely about sort of listening to what's, what's concerning the other side. And I think that um, one of the things that Maggie does well in the book is to, to bring that to greater light than it's been brought, brought before, uh, this concern about really the origins of life. I mean, I think that's what fundamentally it comes down to, and the great uh, mystery of our biological connection to our mothers and fathers. And that's something that I've written about before and, and, and alluded to before, but it's not something that gets a lot of attention, and I appreciate the fact that the book gives it some attention. How about you, Maggie? Um, well, John's a very impressive human being. He is unfailingly kind as well as intelligent and very engaging. He's also, you know, we, we get pigeonholed as we debate, particularly on a hot button issue, and we take our sides. Um, but what I, one of the things that interests me uh, and part of the process of writing a book with John and debating with John and getting to know him a bit is how many pieces there are to ourselves that go to make up our identity. Mm. And the, my shorthand, as you know, John, is that I like to say that you're the Sicilian gay guy. Right? I mean, this is... Not a bad thing to me. No, but I mean, this, you know, there's a lot of rich, a lot that so you draw. I mean, draw. I'm going to whack you or something? <laughs> no, really terrible, terrible, really terrible really stereotype. Goes, <laughs> terrible stereotype. You can, you it can. goes to the depth of your attract. I mean, the, the idea that biological attachment matters. I mean, this is, this, to me, this is very, I, this is my stereotype of the classic Italian, and particularly maybe the Sicilian family, mm -hmm. and some of the family stories you tell. 
that's just a shorthand. I could have put it in another way, but the, we all, the, the, the things that go into crafting an identity are complex and they go in different directions. Sure. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to what you said. In terms of the actual writing of the book, I don't think I learned a lot that I didn't know. I feel like I do know the arguments for gay marriage and why people believe them at a fairly deep emotional level. Um, when you know and care about people, they get deeper. But um, I think I did make, for me, the value, and this is my, I think I advanced my own argument. I, I was able to say things in a new way. I knew more about my own argument. Because as a of the of iterative that. process? Or just because you knew that you yeah, were? Maybe, it may have just been the process of writing a book, David. Yeah. I'm not sure it was the, you know, the, I've been debating gay marriages as John has, but I mean, literally since 2003, that's what I've been doing. So I've had a lot of interaction. Um, and I thought hard about, one of the things I think it did help is I thought very hard about how to make my point of view visible. Because I know John's very smart and he's a person of goodwill and he has these kind of traditionalist attachments. And uh, so I think maybe knowing that I'm speaking to John was partly part of that process. I don't think I really succeeded that well. Uh, in in your mind, is that who you were speaking to, John? Um, often, but not always. Yeah, yeah. Often. Yeah. You know, the, 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 to me, the best, I mean, the, 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 the kickoff point in the book, which is not really, it, it kind of like, my rebuttal essay comes at the end, but I'm responding to the essay he wrote in the beginning. And to me, the kind of enlightening moment in terms of achieving disagreement uh, was when John begins with a very lovely par uh, parable story of uh, a friend's gay wedding to men. And, and it, there's just this one phrase he's describing the groom, the groom, the, the parents, Everyone's celebrating, and it's part of his tapping into the kind of rich meanings of marriage, which is what he wants for gay marriage to mean. And uh, he, there's just this one sentence that leaps off the page where he says, except for the absence of a bride, it could be just like any other wedding. And that set off an explosion inside of me, really, which is like, what happens when you take the woman out of the wedding? What, what does the woman in the wedding represent? And I think it is, uh, I, to me, this, the gay marriage debate is embedded in a larger sexual revolution since I was a young girl in which we have conspired as a society to create a culture that makes it hard for us to recognize the connection between sex, uh, babies, marriage, mothers, fathers, that makes us hard to make sense of gender. And we when, when you wrote that sentence, I, I want to tell you, you about that sentence. Did you uh, think in your mind, oh, this will really ring her bell? Or, <laughs> or, you want to hear something funny? Because yeah. Maggie has told me before about this sentence. I sent a draft of the book, an early draft of the book, to a friend of mine who gives me very good advice on writing. And one of the things he said is, you know, you describe this wedding scene in, in, in the beginning, but, you know, a lot of people have never been to a quote unquote gay wedding, so you need to, like, flesh it out for them, you know, the smell of the flowers and what was happening, you know, what the church looked like and all. And I'm not a, you know, a, a narrative writer in that way, I'm a philosophy professor. And so I just, you know, as shorthand, it looked just like any other wedding, except there was no bride. <laughs> and, and for me, it was just an easy way to sort of... Kind of a of, description. Yeah, 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 it, was, yeah. It, was, it was, you know, okay, there were flowers, and there was a church, and people were all dressed up, and they were crying. And then, uh, uh, so, you know, so for me, it, it was there as a matter of shorthand. And when I found out that, that it rang Maggie's bell in that way, it, it surprised me. In fact, when we talked about giving titles for the different sections of the book, you had said, you know, that the, the wedding without the bride or something would have been your rebuttal title, taking the Take, bride taking out of the, the wedding. Woman, taking the woman out of the wedding, yes. And, you know, uh, when I think about that, I think, well, well, gosh, I mean, a bride would not be a good thing for these two men that I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and frankly, they would not be a good thing for the bride. And, and, and one of the things we've learned, you know, when we have all these, it usually involves press conferences with politicians with their awkward looking wives in the background. Um, <laughs> So it's sort of like, no, this is not a, a bride is not a good thing for gay men, and a husband is not a good thing for lesbian women, but, but relationships are good things for those people. The, the one other thing I want to follow yeah. up on is it's funny to me that 
the, you think of my awe at the biological connections as rooted in my Sicilian or Italian heritage. I mean, on the one hand, you can think the sort of the, the blood is thicker than water aspect of it. But one of the things that I've experienced in my own family um, is that, it, that the important thing, you know, biological connections, but the important thing is that we're family. And my parents and grandparents and relatives have a very inclusive notion of that, even to the point where you know, my 96-year-old Sicilian grandfather, uh, you know, after Mark and I had, my, my cere had our ceremony together, um, it was funny, when it, when it came time that Christmas for him to give money to my mother to put in the kids' Christmas card, there was an extra $50. And my mother said, what's the extra $50? Like, well, we have to have a card for Mark now. I mean, you know, and, and for me, that just sort of said so much about my family's very expansive and inclusive notion of family that wasn't rooted in biology, but rooted in sort of personal connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, Maggie, that doesn't, that doesn't, I mean, don't get too caught up sure, in this. Sure. It. It's the family. It's the family. The family, the family. But yes, but the, my case is based on yeah. building yeah. family. Yeah. 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 <sighs> if you had a gay child, you think it'd be any different for you? In terms of your thinking, or would it change you to have a gay child? <laughs> it would change me to have a child. That's for no, sure. No, this is for me. this is this is, this is this, I'm asking Maggie. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. No, I uh, I've thought about that uh, very hard, and the, the answer is no. Um, I do, would not want my child if he came to me and said he was gay to enter a gay marriage. I would not think it was good. Um, and I know that, uh, uh, and I would love him to death. Um, first time I was asked that, actually, my older son, you, you know David, I had a child out of wedlock, right out of Yale. And when he was three, a friend of mine from college who's gay, um, we were talking about that possibility with him, and I was like, no, I mean, and he asked me that question, would I love him? And I'm like, yeah, nothing. Nothing is more important to me than my child. I, I didn't ask would you love the, a child who was gay. I, I was asking, and I think you're answering it. Yeah. I was asking if you, um, obviously one can't know, but do you think it would change your thinking on the topic of gay marriage? I think that it would create an ongoing difficult task of loving the most important people in my life across a great difference and I'm assuming that he's not just gay but he's like John he would like you know find a find a mate and want and he would want me to consider it a marriage and so it would obviously be an ongoing issue that we would deal with but I don't think it would change what I think a marriage is or why it matters or in that sense um, no, I don't think so. And I've thought about it pretty hard. I don't, I don't, for conservatives this has come up very early on other issues like abortion. It's the difference between the theoretical abstract principle that sounds good and all the messy reality of life uh, when it's personal. And so, so for me I feel like I, I confronted that early when I, mm -hmm. as an atheist, decided abortion was wrong and then had a child and Mm -hmm. then was launched into that. I don't know why I think those are related, but I think they are. Yeah. Did you say as an atheist? Yeah, I was an atheist in college. Okay. Yeah. I was a pro-life atheist. You were a Catholic about the time she <laughs> was, was an atheist. atheist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, it was one of these things with the... the yeah, the yeah. <laughs> they, got, they got switched up. And, yeah, you know, so. yeah. Um, John, what is, the, what is the portion of your argument that you have the most inner doubt about of its, of its veracity? I could tell you that, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> uh, no, I, you know, for me, uh, the aspects of doubt are not, they're about certain premises, but they're, they're premises that I think are, are non-essential to the argument. So, I mean, one of the things I, I talk about in the rebuttal is how it's not clear to me how letting same-sex couples marry will make people, will make mothers and fathers any less bound to their children, uh, or will change our notion of the importance of, of caring for 
first of all, being careful about creating offspring and then and, and then caring for the offspring that we. You're can, responding to Maggie. Right, yeah, I'm responding to, to Maggie. I mean, one of the things yeah. I talk about is like I, mean, I think there are not just missing steps in this argument, but entire missing staircases between the premise that children need a mother and father and the conclusion that same-sex couples should not be allowed to marry. But remember, I'm asking you about right. doubts about your right. argument. Right. So, so I, I say that, you know, I just, I just don't see how to connect those dots. Um, and then there are times, you know, reading some of what, what Maggie has said, where, you know, I, I think to myself, may, maybe we really don't pay attention enough to sort of the great responsibility of creating new life. And maybe in some way, uh, same-sex marriage would um, make, that, make it even harder to get us to pay attention to, to that. Uh, because, I mean, the, the culture is clearly changing on this. I mean, this is one of the things that, you know, I've noticed recently as I've had a niece, um, because people keep asking me, you know, now do you want children of your own? And I say no. And they say, well, why not? As if the default setting is that I would. <laughs> and I always thought one of the things about being gay is that the default setting is that I don't, right? The default setting is that I, I don't know, I get to go to Key West or something. And, say, <laughs> uh, I, I, and I'm half joking, because I, I mean, I, 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 I love my nieces, and, but I'm just not a kid person. And, and, and yet, um, you know, for a lot of people now, uh, it's it's becoming. I mean, with your, I saw a you picture mean because in the, of the gay marriage. Well, argument? I, you see, but this is like the you're thing. You're supposed I mean, to I, get married and have well, a child. Well, I, but this is the thing. So I think is it because marriage is more of an issue that you know people it's like the first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby and the baby carriage. That people automatically are going to start assuming yeah, I, I, that that's I, the next step. I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And you heard. You probably heard that. <laughs> and then I think well, I, I, I so so I, I you know I I doubt that, but I have doubts about my skepticism there. Maybe the, maybe the connection is more powerful than I think. So, but I also want to say right. that I think let that us that, make our case yet, David. I, I think that that train has left the station in a way. That right? I mean, this, this is happening in a state okay, like okay. Michigan. All where, right. All right. Yeah. But what I want to, what I want to, what I want to isolate just for a moment sure. is that um, uh, I'm not saying that you're persuaded, right. but I'm saying that when you, when I said, what's the position that you have the most inner doubt about yeah. it would be that you're, you find yourself reflecting upon this. Yeah. There's something I call this. the emboldening argument that more, more same-sex couples yeah. will want to create children. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I have a number of reasons why I think that that argument doesn't work. But maybe, I mean, maybe yeah. there's some more to that than, I, yeah. than, I, than we yeah. grant. Yeah. What do you think the weakest point in your argument is? Oh, is that the same question as the one I have the most doubt about? Yes. Um, That's right. Neither, I'm sorry. Neither, it's the former. It's ne what yeah, do you have the, the most, most inner doubt, doubt about? about. The, yeah. the, the, I think neither John and I have a lot of doubts, not surprisingly. We're pretty confident. Um, I have doubt in the form, the strange form of hope. This is what I hope I'm wrong about. I hope, Jonathan Rausch once said to me in a private conversation, so I probably shouldn't share it. Not that it's personal. It's just us. Jonathan, it's just us. if you're out there, don't uh, worry. Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> no, uh, but um, uh, we were talking about what some I've called the religious liberty consequences, which, you know, it's an issue for religion, but what we actually began with thinking about that is what are the consequences for the marriage culture? of law and society adopting a new public norm that says gay is the same as straight. If you see any difference between gay and straight couples, there's something wrong with you, which I do think is the, the heart of marriage equality. You could imagine getting to gay marriage in all kinds of ways, but the way we're actually getting to it is this strong new public norm of equality. And um, so, years ago, Jonathan Rouse said to me, well, you know, maybe it'll be just like contraception, which is, you know, after it's all over and you guys win, then everyone will just give up being concerned that there's like a bunch of crazy Catholics out there who believe weird things like it's wrong to use contraception. And I was like, no, I don't really think that, but it was a very hopeful, perversely hopeful thought for me that if, if gay marriage, maybe it won't have the set of consequences that I see unfolding. That you, that you have argued that it would be likely to have. 
Well, that I see, I would say that I see unfolding. I mean, to yeah. me, the power of framing ideas, yeah. which seems kind of cognitive and abstract to a lot of people, is the most important thing about a social institution or a public argument is what, what is the core framing idea? Because then it tends to unfold and all these, and I do see it unfold. So I, don't, I wouldn't say I have a lot of doubt about it, but the future doesn't necessarily have to be like the past. What if, in, you, what if say we lose, which I don't believe we are going to, but so, suppose we did, and 20 years from now, a bunch of gay guys who grew up in a society where they feel equal and valued said, hey, that, that, that you know, it's not a big deal. Let people think and say, and they, you know, we're, we're, we, you, can, you can be honored and, 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 and be treated as equal citizens, and you can, you know, we'll probably can't use the public schools to promote your ideas, but I mean, they'll be, it's hard for me to see, really. I'm trying to paint the most optimistic picture I can. But you think that but, could, I mean, what's interesting to me is you both. The, I don't think that it, yeah, I, yeah it, it is the thing on which I probably doubt the most because I hope the most that I'm wrong. Yeah. I think you both, interestingly enough, without saying you've changed your mind or anything like that, you've each identified as something that you have the most inner doubt about, <coughs> or you have some inner doubt about the things that are not peripheral parts of your argument, but are absolutely fundamental <coughs> parts of the argument. Um, John, uh, it's often stated by proponents of gay marriage that the, right, that, that the ability to marry the person you choose is a right. Mm -hmm. It is a right. right. Does it in any way trouble you as a philosopher that the discussion of human goods in this area is taking the form of an assertion of a right. Does that, does that cause you any pause? Maybe, but for very general reasons, uh, could, because I think we're, we tend to be sloppy about rights talk. I mean, for one thing, we're not clear, are we talking about a constitutional right, or a more general legal right, a moral right. I mean, what do we mean when we're talking about rights? And I think people tend to be very sloppy when they're talking about rights talk. And I don't do a lot of rights talk because, frankly, that's not ultimately where I'm most concerned. I mean, as I often say, you know, it's one thing for the state to let you marry and you to have a right to marry. It's another thing for your parents to be happy for you and show up at the wedding and recognize it as the good thing that it is. And that's really where my focus is. So it, it troubles me, but it troubles me for a, a very general reason. I don't know this because I haven't asked you both, but I would imagine, guessing, that perhaps all three of us might believe that some of the opposition to gay marriage stems from feelings of, uh, of disdain for gay people and feelings of disgust toward uh, homosexual uh, conduct. And the question I, I want to ask you is uh, how much, if any, do you, th in other words, to, to what degree is opposition to gay marriage aided by people's feelings of disdain toward gay people and disgust at, at homosexual conduct. How much of that is at play in, in, in driving the opposition, and, if, and, how, and what do we make of whatever that assessment is? And, that, and that's really to both of you. You want me to talk first? Sure. Um. I will tell you it's not what I meet in the people I know or the people I work with or the people who really are now willing to take the risk of speaking up. People who are acting out of instinctive revulsion, the limited number I've run into, are actually fairly easily turned by the power relations. You're now sort of paring down in terms of, I, I, I don't know how, when you have seven million people voting, I don't know how they're all voting right. and what they are. So I'm really only speaking out of the, 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 the people that I know and that I work with. I think um, 
moral disagreement with homosexuality rooted in a religious understanding is a significant part of it for a great many people, not everyone. Um, but I, and I also think there's a sort of instinctive sense. The, you know, the, the thing I say that I think moves people, it even moves a lot of people who disagree with me, is the idea we're born, this is the, the great truths of Genesis. We are born male and female. We're called to come together in love, to give ourselves to each other, and to um, the great task of, uh, of new life. And I think that's the heart of the marriage vision. And I will tell you, there is a reason why the marriage issue is standing when public opposition to homosexuality is not. People are, st and, and there's a reason why NAM is the most successful organization. It's because it stands on the good that people care about primarily. And it's an activist organization, and sometimes it's, hey, and you can critique this, but the, the, what really is, mo many, many people were using the gay issue through direct mail to generate fear and disgust. And actually, that's a, that's a failing, it's not only a wrong strategy, it's a failing strategy, especially when you start to hit real fire. And the question, people will only stand, uh, reactionary um, and fear-based appeals do, do fail. They're, they will sustain you for a while. In the end, the people who are going to stand in this are going to be standing on something they think is good. And so um, I don't want to, I mean, you know, as I, I said, there's a lot of people out there. And the other thing I will say is, um, in defense of this view, is, you know, this has always been the way that I've approached it. And I see this very intense reaction among what we would call the base to it. That people Sorry, flock to among it. Among the base. The base. The base. You know, so your the, base. I, yeah, the heart of the people who oppose to gay marriage. Um, I think this is what is motivating them to stand more. I don't know if this would be what good is, or bad. Maggie, this the good that the, the, good, the good that they're the, standing on, not an instinctual revulsion against gay people, um, which, uh, but to be to stretch myself towards your implicit point of view or the question you have, a sense that there's an inversion of the order of nature involved in trying to have a way, you know, the, the, the flip side of believing that we are male and female and called to give ourselves to the next generation is a sense of that the, the order is being violated. There's a, there's something sacred is being t turned on its head. And, yeah. and so that, I don't know if that's discussed at homosexuality, but it is a kind of related instinctual sense that is part of the power of the opposition to same-sex marriage. You know, it's funny, since we're doing this as a sort of casual conversation, that I, I listen to Maggie talk about these things quite a bit, and normally I can do so in a sort of even-keeled way, but when you start talking about the inversion of the order of nature, I I know. Yeah, I, know. I don't usually actually. I don't. And, and you don't. And, and you know. And, and, and I was trying to be honest about. Well, no, I appreciate what he that. I, I, I do on. appreciate that. The thing is, is that I think that there are a lot of thoughtful, decent, intelligent people who put forth really bad arguments sometimes against same-sex relations, not just marriage, but same-sex relations more generally. And that sometimes there's a profound distortion uh, of reality, really. I mean, that what they see and experience and what is actually happening are, are so out of line. I mean, I, I had an experience a week or so ago, as you know, on a television show where the host you know, claimed that I was bullying him and belittling him. And if you look at the, I mean, it's exactly the opposite is happening. And, and, and so it's like, oh, so. Were you busy, try, you tried to say something? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Crazy <laughs> thought. <laughs> you uppity gay guy. I, yeah, I'm an uppity gay guy. That's, that's, that's what I do. So, 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 okay, so I need to come up with some kind of explanation for that. And so one possible explanation for that, and I think one likely explanation for that, is a kind of visceral disgust at same-sex relations. And you know why I, I, I think that? And you know why I um, feel pretty confident in attributing a lot of it to that? Is because I experienced that at one time in my life. One of the reasons that coming out is so difficult for so many gay people, I came out at 19, which is you know, over two decades ago. But one of the reasons that coming out is that 
you grow up with this notion that that homosexuality is scary, awful, this inversion of nature kind of, you know, that God wants to vomit when he thinks about this sort of thing. You hear all of that stuff, and you internalize that, and then you find yourself being attracted to people of the same sex, and like, oh my God, that means that I'm gay, that means I, you know, I make God vomit, and I, 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 I'm unnatural and sick and perverted, and, and it's scary, and so, I recognize the distorting influence of those messages in my own life because it, that's part of what made it so hard for me to come out as a gay person at 19. And I was the lucky person. I mean, I had an, an internalization. An internalization of, of these messages. So, so you know, I, I don't doubt that, that Maggie and many of the people on Maggie's side are, no, it's not that they want to hurt gay people or, you know, want to be mean to gay people or something. But that message is powerful and, and subtle. Um, and, and I think it operates a, a great deal more than people realize, and certainly a great deal more than Maggie is inclined to recognize. <clears throat> Maggie, uh, I don't think I've ever, um, in your writings, seen you do this. I'm not sure, but I don't think you have. But sometimes, Opponents of gay marriage, when they say that, when they say or use the term gay marriage or same-sex marriage, they put marriage in quotes, as if in the implication of that is that, I think, the implication of that is that regardless of what uh, judges or gay people or misinformed people might believe, that the the the, the, the what these people are saying they're doing maybe all kinds of things, but it's simply not marriage. Yes. And so uh, the quotations are meant to denote the idea that there is something um, fundamental about marriage that uh, uh, attention must be paid. So that if I showed, for example, John a picture of a flower, and John said, well, that's a very nice tree, I would say, no, John, sorry, that this is a flower, not a tree. And he would say, no, I, I, all the judges say it's a tree. And I would say, John says it's a flower. Now, what do you make of that way of seeing marriage, that way that, that those quotation marks? And as I say, I don't think you've ever done this. That in my, that I, I've, I, don't, I don't use that. I mean, I do understand. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, it's a strategy of people who feel uh, in the process of being dominated by other people's use of, of language. Yeah. And I don't use it in part because um, I don't like to set off cultural markers in that way that separate me from the audience I'm trying to reach. And at some point, language is used in different ways. But actually, the, the heart of the argument, as you describe it, I actually make in, in this book. I, I believe that, and I've been misunderstood as making a primarily consequentialist argument. I do believe gay marriage will have consequences, and I've uh, explained why and how uh, changing the public meaning of this core institution is going to take it off its ancient cross-cultural message and task and put it on a new task of demonstrating equal respect for gay people. But um, the most important argument is that it's not true. These same-sex unions are not marriages. and. Uh, and then I try to explain, you know, in some sense, you can use a word to mean anything at all. When I say it's not a marriage, I mean it exactly, and we do talk about this. You know, to, you can say that the word cat includes the word dog because they're similar. You know, there you think about it, they're four legs and a tail, we love them as pets, they're similar. Um, but what happens when you, but, but there's a reason that we call cats cats. There's an there's a integrity to the thing that a cat is that if you take it to this higher level of abstraction, what you have lost is the actual meaning. If we, if we tried, we, we might want to say that mothers and fathers are both equal. But if we tried to insist that the word mother means either mother or father, we would lose the capacity to see what a mother is and, and who is one, right? So it's in that, that spirit um, uh, that I think the most important question about gay marriage is, is it true that these are marriages? And to answer that question involves, launches you into a discussion of, of what you think marriage is and where it came from and what its, what its core features are. 
and you know, to me, a husband is a man who has committed himself, who takes on the task of editing his sexuality to make it pleasing to a woman and to make it safe for her and the children that they make. That's what it means to decide to be a husband. Um, a man who doesn't want to do that for good reasons, as you point out, the bride would not be useful. It would not be a good thing to do to a woman, right? Is not doing the work of marriage, as I understand it, the core, the heart of what it is. John, what do you make of that? I, I feel the question is unfair to you because I know that you <clears throat> would, and in the book, spend many pages responding to that. Can you, um, I guess, what the right word? S say whatever you want to say about that argument. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but n knowing that pithy is better. Um, right. So I do spend a lot of pages in the book. Uh, I guess this is a place where I think that Maggie's argument is entirely circular, unless you supplement it with a consequentialist argument. Because here's the thing, okay? So she thinks that her fund says in the book that her fundamental argument against my argument is that that claim about marriage is not true. Well, I could make the same claim about your view of marriage is not true. I mean, in a way, I mean, we start with, with with the understanding that we think what we're saying is true. Otherwise, we wouldn't say it sincerely. So then the question is. Give me a reason why your view is a better view of things than mine. And unless you supplement it, and, and one way to do that, of course, is to say, look, you know, if we don't have a special term reserved for heterosexual relationships of this sort, if we don't re reserve the term marriage for that, then something bad is going that's to happen. That, but that's consequentialist. Unless you do that, then. I, then I can do what I call in the book the marriage marriage maneuver, which is where I say, okay, let's stop for a minute. It's not marriage. It's something else. Let's call it marriage. But why not do marriage then? I mean, just, that's uh, so you you need to supplement it with that further argument. Well, Otherwise, you could call it, it just, civil unions. You, you could call it civil unions, but I mean, this goes back to the point about what it is we're in fact doing. And I, in, in my view, and I, I explain this in the book, is that when we go to civil unions, uh, even if we try to put it the same on paper, it turns out not to be the same in effect. What, what, what but we agree that, I mean, we agree John, that can words I ask matter. Just one clarifying question. Sure. How would you respond to this other example that takes it out of the whole gay marriage round? How would you respond to the proposal that the government pass a law and says that the word mother will have to mean either mother or father for all public purposes. I think that would be an annoying law. I think it would be a pointless <laughs> would be law. Would it be untrue? No, I don't think, I don't think. I, it could it, be it, true when we that look, fathers are not mothers. Wouldn't the, wouldn't the better it? analogy right. be that henceforth all of these people will be called parents right. only? Wouldn't yeah. that be a better look. analogy? No. No. no, because it's no. pointing to the, I mean, it's, whether a claim is true or false. Let's, let's stick with the way yeah, Maggie wanted to say Whether a claim is true or false depends on the meaning of the terms in that claim. Now, you're asking me if we change the meanings of the term. Well, then that's going to change what, what would make that claim true or what would make that claim false. So you literally think that the, the claim back to reality is not dispositive here. You, that, Look, you know, the the some sophisticated people, way to say this is that, yes, language is an interactive process in which we you know, use words to refer to categories that reflect underlying things. And the truth of the, the, the claim that it's not true to put fathers in the category of mothers is based on the idea that so doing so covers up reality in a way and makes it harder to communicate. So it's really about the idea that, in fact, mothers and fathers are such distinctly different things in truth that if, using one word, you can do that. You can pass a law and say that the word red means green, right? But if you're trying to actually communicate on the meaning of, of, of what it is, is there anything wrong except for practical consequences? Of a law of such a law, would that would that? Well, I mean, there might be, be there might be well something there might well be something be wrong or bad. about the, the use of the law there and what the law is up to in telling people how to use words. I mean, there, I have all kinds of fundamental reactions to to the to the justification of that. But truth and falsity, uh, we can only talk about truth and falsity after we get clear on the meaning of the words. 
And you're asking me to say, well, if we change the meaning of the words, well, if we change the meaning of the words, then the truth conditions for those claims are going to end up being different. But, and, and I explain this in, in the rebuttal to the book, I, I think there's just fundamental confusion about the philosophy of language here. But I also think it's weird that we're having a, an argument about the philosophy of language rather than an argument about, well, what would be the problem with including, with, with treating marriage as this kind of fundamental commitment that both same-sex couples and different sex couples can have. You think it might turn our attention away from this fundamental biological reality? Fine, let's talk no, about that and not get caught up that's in putting, this meaning of words No, that's putting stuff. it in a consequentialist term. Because right. to me, the first question is, is the, the premise of marriage equality true? Is it true that same-sex and opposite-sex unions are the same? for the purposes of marriage. I understand. Yes. I right. want to I want to well, I want to we'll I want to get off the philosophy of language now. I want to get out. No, it's a, it's a very interesting point and uh, I, I know that each of you spend a lot of time on, on that book and it's a, it's a very uh, philosophically serious topic uh, aspect of all this. So, thank you for that. Um, is there anything that you feel either of you feel that can be said by the happy three that's new? In other words, um, uh, most, I'm speaking only for myself now, most, in my opinion, most of this debate has been um, uh, uh, forms of uh, shouting, forms of uh, trotting out talking points all day, every day, um, uh, it's lots of accusations of bad faith. It, 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 I mean, I'm not saying there aren't a lot of good things that have been said. Of course there are. But I don't, in my own view, it has not been a particularly uh, elevated. elevated discussion. Um, and we can all say what our reasons are for that. But at this date, just the three of us, is there anything and the thousands of people and the, watching in the in the thousands or is there do you do you feel that there's any any new anything new that we can talk about that hasn't been reduced to the kind of talking point I mean the reason I didn't ask the, sorry for this little speech the reason I didn't ask you to begin with an explication of your argument is I think that I and everyone else out there has heard these arguments a zillion times. So I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. So I thought it was because you wanted everyone to buy the book. Well, that too. <laughs> that, would be, uh, that would be good too. You know, no, look, I, David, I, I, first of all, I want to say this. Um, you and I are on different sides of this debate, but I th think that we are on the same side of wanting to elevate the conversation. And one of the things I've always appreciated about you is that you don't just talk the talk on that, you walk the walk. And you've tried to you know, reach out to people like our mutual friend Jonathan Rausch and, and other things you've done. And, and, and your willingness to do this today is another example of that. So I appreciate that. I mean, I think that the most important thing that people can learn from this today is not some sort of claim that we'll put up and that all three of us can raise our hand and endorse so much as it's possible for mm -hmm. us to have a thoughtful conversation mm -hmm. that might actually get us to understand a little bit better where one another are coming from. And that's, that's huge. I mean, I don't think we should sort of say, oh, yeah, oh, we can all get along and have a nice conversation. Oh, uh, I, I think that there's something to be said for that, because as you say, that's rare. And I think there are a lot of people out there um, who are hungry for that sort of thing, or at least I'd like to believe that. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I think, you know, one of the problems with a debate being not only polarized but feeling dangerous is there's a whole lot of very just, I mean, just think intellectually, morally, and spiritually interesting things to think about that we don't. Um, and I would say it's one of the reasons I've stepped away. I mean, the first reason is the absolutely brilliant competence of Brian Brown as the president of the National Organization for Marriage. He's here in the audience. Thanks, Brian. But um, the second reason I've stepped away from the leadership team of NAM is I, I really don't think I'm by nature, and I think I'm an accidental activist. What I think I'm, what I really care about 
is, is truth and insight. I think I've never written or even delved or permitted myself to think a lot about sexual orientation as a concept, what it means, and the experience. Because I know, frankly, there's not a bunch of gay guys out there who are really interested in hearing me talk about it. And I've been trying to focus debate on marriage because it's what I felt called to do. And I think it's the most important part of the gay marriage debate. Uh, the nature, what does it say about sexual desire? What is sexual desire a desire for? Uh, it's probably actually the core question of my intellectual career, which is divvied up into different forms. How does a social institution work? What is sexual desire for? What is sexual desire a desire for is to oh, me. Oh, I see. Right. Got it. Um, and I think it's much more complicated than any of the answers we've been offering ourselves. And I think um, what I know as a woman and what you know as a gay man, if we ever had some time to talk about it, would probably enlighten us both. I, or at least it po the possibility, I am fascinated. We're living through cultural upheaval since I was a young woman, some of which I think are good and many of which I think are not very good. Um, how, does culture, how does the culture come to become dominant? How do these rules get set? And who are they, how do they get enforced? Um, I think the unfolding debate in my front seat that has given me a lot, and I, I know there's a number of thinkers who, not so much on gay marriage, but uh, people like Randall Collins, who's written on the sociology of philosophy. You buy this accidental activist uh, thesis? You know, I'm going to hesitate a little bit to say what I'm about to say, because it, it, it's going to make it sound like I'm saying you're two-faced, and I don't think that. And I, in fact, I say explicitly in the book that that's not true. Um, but I see a different Maggie than a lot of people see, or at least think they see. And you know, I, I can, you know, Maggie and I will go to a campus and do a debate, and you know, as we're heading back to the hotel room afterwards, we'll sit down to talk for a few minutes, and two, a few minutes can turn into an hour or so, talking about you know, interesting ideas, and philosophy and ethics and sexuality and so on. Um, but I think when a lot of people think of you, they think of you as, as the nom lady yeah. uh, who's out to, to stop know. them from getting married. And you, yeah. you've done that. Uh, that, is, yeah. that is part of who you well, are as well. Um, you know, I, 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 it's not for me to say which yeah, you enjoy yeah, doing yeah, more, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, at the core yeah. of your being. But I, but I know yeah. that side of you yeah. that really would actually prefer yeah. to sit down and have a long, thoughtful conversation about these yeah. issues rather than be out there um, organizing against something or, 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 or yeah. doing that. OK, uh, we we're, we're need to make our transition to uh, questions and answers. But here, one last thing. This is kind of a, one of those Rorschach test things. You know, um, uh, <clears throat> this debate is basically about fill in the blank. This de not not with a long thing, but just with a couple of words or something. This debate is basically about what? Human relationship. This debate is basically about? The relationship between sex and babies. 